for those of you who just joined, I'm Sue Ostoff with the National Clearinghouse for the Defense of Battered Women. And thanks a lot for being part of this webinar, which is actually the 15th in our series of webinars about expert witnesses um, in cases that involve survivors of battering, sexual assault, and or other forms of trauma. And before we go further, I do want to thank the Office on Violence Against Women for their support of this webinar and for the support of our work on expert witnesses. So as you're probably aware, today's webinar is titled Reframing Batter Battering as Coercive Control, Expert Testimony and Case Presentation. And so in an effort to save time, I will do a very brief introduction of our speaker today. And you know, it's interesting because it's not easy to do a short introduction of Dr. He's 75 Dr. years old, so. I thought he was 74. You just Okay, I lied. Yeah. I started with a lie. <laughs> so he's 75 years old, um, but you can read the bio here. I know the type's a little small, but I think most of you will be able to read that. You can also download it if you need to from your um, Google Drive. Also, there's two articles that we put up there that you may want to look at, and if you went um, to the drive earlier today, they might not have been there. So there's one about expert testimony that Evan wrote, and there's also one, an article about coercive control, and we thought you might be interested in seeing those. So really, how to introduce Evan. Um, you can see some of his accomplishments in his bio, but he has so many of them that it certainly wouldn't fit on one sl slide. For purposes of this training, this webinar, I think it's important to note that Evan has just done extensive writing and training about coercive control. I mean, he literally wrote the book on it. And he's done that here in the US and really around the world. And also, the other thing that's important to note is that he's participated as an expert in more than 100 cases here in the US and in Canada. And those include criminal cases, family law cases, child welfare cases. So it's just important to note in civil cases, he's really done a lot of expert witnessing in a lot of different arenas. Um, but I just want to take a minute to say what I really appreciate about Evan is his passion about his work. And I, I you know, Evan, I was thinking about this, and I, what I really appreciate also is how instrumental you've been at helping just a lot of people around the world, I think, really get, and for many people for the first time, what it is like for someone to be genuinely controlled by her or his partner. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think you've really helped people get it in a way that some people haven't. And I, and I also think that you've really helped people get in a way that, like I said, I think some people have not before gotten the truly terrible consequences of this kind of abuse. And, I, I, and this is to quote Evan, on women's safety, autonomy, dignity, and liberty. And I just think that's a great quote, so I appreciate that. The other thing I was thinking about you, Evan, is that you're very generous with your time and information. And your willingness to share your enormous knowledge base is just terrific. I mean, I know a part of it is because you're very eager to increase the pool of expert witnesses. But the other <laughs> thing is you're very, very generous, and we really appreciate that. And finally, I just want to say that I've had more than a few spirited discussions with Dr. Stark over the years. And as I mentioned earlier, I really do appreciate his passion for the work. And even though I may not always agree with him, I really do admire his smarts. So we're very pleased to have you. Evan, and so I just really want to thank you. So thank you for doing Thank this. you, and thank you, Sue. And the, the admiration is mutual, even if it, uh, you're not quite as old. Um, well, just the, let me finish quickly before oh, I you're not get over to you. I just want to note, because now we're up to 125 people, if you have questions during the presentation, um, put them in the chat box. Cindine Pizzell will be collecting them and will be posing as many as she can to Evan at the end of the webinar. We plan to leave about 15 minutes. Um, Evan has enough material for about three webinars here, so we'll do the best we can. He has a lot to say. Um, and we are going to hold questions till the end, so we're going to let Evan go until, you know, Evan, if you can really try to keep about 15 minutes available at the end, that would be terrific. Absolutely. And I also have uh, said uh, that I'm very happy for folks to email me questions or uh, 
comments and I'll respond as best I can in the time that I can. I may maybe a few days before I respond, but I absolutely will promise to respond. And if I can't find the answer, if I don't have the answer, um, I'll find it. <clears throat> Excuse my voice, a little raspy um, today. Um, Susan's point, I think, about this work being international, I just want to start by uh, pointing out, I'm not sure if everyone on the webinar knows this, and I definitely want to greet you. I, there are a lot of people I could, Vicki and others, who I could greet personally, and a lot of old friends on the webinar, so I'm very flattered. Um, but I don't know how many of you are aware that as of uh, January um, of 2015, a coercive control became a criminal offense in the United Kingdom, particularly England and Wales, carrying a, a sentence, a maximum sentence of five years. And there have been a number of convictions uh, under that new offense. Um, the other thing I think, uh, and it bears on something Susan said, is that the greatest publicity we have received in understanding of coercive control came not from any of the educationals I was doing or Women's Aid was doing in the United Kingdom, but from the adoption of coercive control as a theme uh, by the Archers, which is the most popular soap, radio soap in Europe. It's 15 minutes a day. And for the last two years, it has been broadcasting uh, a, a, th a themed a story about coercive control, which culminated in the wife stabbing the husband and then a one-hour special with uh, guests on the jury from WHO, Dr. WHO, and from uh, senior members of parliament. And the woman was acquitted of all counts. Although, to continue the story, uh, just as she was leaving the courtroom, he leaned over and said, you haven't seen anything yet. So we're promised a custody fight and what have you. But millions of people have... Uh, become aware, of course, of control, not only in their own lives, but as a general problem in ways that nothing we have done could have achieved. And so we're hoping sometime in the next couple of years, we started meetings in New York with some of the media people here uh, to do something uh, comparable. Um, so the first thing I want to do is, uh, because I think it makes uh, sense out of what we're about, uh, is to bring one of my clients into the room. And, and this is a recent client. I haven't talked about her case before, uh, and I can't use her name or any specifics really that identify her because the case is still ongoing. But I hope that each of you, as we talk, will bring someone you know or someone you're working with, a client now or past, uh, into the room so that even if we don't finish, all we have to say uh, you'll be able to relate what I'm talking about uh, to your own, your own work and to your own experience. So let's call this woman Jeanette. Now, and Jeanette uh, had an argument with her husband, Keith, um, about their youngest son, uh, Aiden, uh, leaving the lights on in the garage. Uh, as was his want, uh, he started yelling and screaming, cursing, calling her names, cunt, nigger, his favorite names. Uh, she's a, um, an Italian woman, uh, but dark-skinned from Sicily. Um, she went quietly, as was also her typical response, into the bedroom, taking her dinner on a ceramic plate, got into bed. Um, Keith followed her in, grabbed the plate, smashed it on the ground, uh, then followed up by taking the vacuum cleaner, vacuuming up a little bit of what uh, she had, uh, what had spilled there, and then rubbing the vacuum cleaner hose in her nose, um, the pipe, cursing her out, um, and then uh, got on top of her, um, and uh, she, she reported, this was the angriest I ever saw him. Uh, he threatened me with the handle of the vacuum cleaner up in my face. He then put his forearm on her face and neck, choked her, pushed her cheekbone with all his weight, which he had done two or three times before. Um, then uh, she reported he had that blank look, and she recognized that from previous assaults. And she told the investigator, he's yelling how he hates his life and me and how he wishes I would die. Uh, he has a dazed look in his eye, and he loses it. Um, 
Jay, and she, she further told the investigator, when he put his hands on me, I got the gun out from the safe. She crawled, I crawled across the bed, grabbed the gun, the Luger. He stood by the dresser and said, what are you going to do, shoot me? Then shoot me. I said, no, I, I just want to be safe. At that point, Keith left the room, but he returned after a few minutes. He accused her of taking his pain meds, his cell phone, and the keys to the car to keep him from leaving. He then grabbed her phone, told her uh, she, she couldn't have a phone, or if he couldn't have a phone, she wouldn't either. And then she replied, I don't want your phone. At this point, all she recalled was that Keith continued to scream and yell. She told me he thinks he was coming towards her, but she couldn't say for sure. And she told the investigator, I didn't think, I just shot. Now, when police arrived, uh, Keith was still alive, and he told the police she didn't mean it, uh, she wasn't trying to kill him, uh, and so forth. And he died a few hours uh, later, and she was charged uh, with homicide. Now, um, I'm just going to tell you a few things about the case, and then I'm going to come back to this uh, again and again, uh, throughout um, our conversation. Now, I realize my conversation is really about expert testimony, and I'm going to talk only about it in general terms um, because most of you will not be doing clinical assessments. But I will use this case uh, as il illustrative um, because it's one that I have uh, done as a clinical assessment. Um, there were a few incidents like this with the forearm, uh, but uh, Jeanette insisted when I talked to her that there had been no violence in her relationship prior to 2014. They had been married, by the way, for uh, 19 years. Um, uh, they had uh, two of their own children, um, let's call them Aiden and Brianna, and, they, and she had a child by a previous marriage uh, who was 20, uh, 22, I think, uh, at the time. Um, she didn't remember the incident, as she indicated. She had a kind of traumatic amnesia, which is not unusual in these cases. Um, both of them had been using cocaine and heroin and abusing pain meds. Uh, there were two calls to the police, but neither one of them had resulted in a complaint or an arrest. In both cases, she had taken refuge in the gun store they both owned, and when the police came, she uh, refused to talk to them. Um, something about her history, uh, she had been sexually abused by uh, her uncle when she was uh, eight or nine, um, um, we don't know for how long because she doesn't remember the details. Um, she also remembers her mother's abuse and, in fact, told me that when he smashed the ceramic dish, uh, she recalled an incident where her father had smashed the glass ashtray, sending shards of glass all over the house. Um, she'd been married previously, as I indicated. Uh, there was no abuse, although she said he was, emo he was emotionally abusive, but no physical abuse. Um, and she's still close friends with uh, her, her first husband. She talks to him probably all the time. And, in fact, um, he's probably the only person that she had regular communication with. Um, there was an uncorroborated report uh, of uh, Keith's abuse of, of Aiden. Oh, I should have said, um, I'm sorry, Aiden is not his biological, their biological child. Aiden is Tiffany's biological child who was left because of her heroin addiction with them, and they adopted uh, her. And there's one report uh, from a neighbor um, about his shooting a gun outside the house. But basically, that was all the record uh, that I had uh, to go with. So I'm just going to stop there and just move into uh, our discussion uh, and I will just say as a caveat, I, I do expert testimony, but apart from the article I've distributed, which I wrote 10 years ago, I don't really think about what I do. I didn't learn this in school. Um, obviously, domestic violence was not a topic when we started out doing our research at Yale in the uh, mid-'70s, and Ann and I helped open one of the first battered women's shelters. So we didn't learn domestic violence in school. And I, I, although I went to social work school, I never studied forensics. So when I started to be asked to do expert testimony, I had to make it up on the spot and basically talk to some friends, but essentially have evolved uh, largely through dialogue with other experts in the field and people 
who are professional psychologists, which I'm not. I, my PhD, as you see, is in sociology, and I have a degree in social work. So I'm, I'm not trained to do psychological evaluation and certainly had no training in writing uh, professional uh, reports. So this is all something I've had to learn. I, I came up as an advocate and as a researcher uh, and uh, only did this because there was a lot of pressure in cases for me to do that. The other thing I have to say is that at least when I started this work, um, there was a lot of stigma attached to women who killed their partners or committed other crimes in the context of being abused, um, in part because I think there was an image uh, afoot that somehow women's violence made us extremely uncomfortable or that all women's violence was defensive, and therefore women who had a long history of criminality, as many of my low-income clients and minority clients uh, had, uh, were really not typical battered women, as that phrase was at the time uh, used. So the background uh, is essentially that um, violence and emotional abuse alone can't adequately characterize uh, the experience of, of most battered victims. Uh, advocates have known that for years, ever since the first woman told us violence wasn't the worst part. I remember as if it were yesterday, a woman and her nine-year-old daughter hiding at our house before we opened the first shelter here in New Haven, um, that, uh, you know, but, but we had no idea what she meant, at least I didn't. And asking her again to talk about the violence symbolized the fact that we were really uh, unaware that there were other dimensions since the most visible, the most tangible harm was clearly the physical that we could see. Um, for all kinds of reasons I won't have time to go into, but I deal with extensively in a lot of writings and, and in the book on coercive control, uh, the violence model, I believe, has completely failed us. And then I will say domestic violence is not only not about violence, it's not, nor is it uh, domestic. Increasingly in the rest of the world, less so in the United States, unfortunately, coercive control is at the center of our understanding of gender violence against women. Uh, and and uh, the European Council, 46 nations, uh, a number of countries in Europe have now adopted coercive control either alongside or in place of domestic violence definitions. In that sense, the United States is the laggard. And, and bringing coercive control into the American court system is extremely difficult, precisely because our definitions are still so heavily wed to the episodic definition of domestic violence as a kind of assault. Um, there's an increasing awareness, however, that coercive control is a legitimate type of domestic violence. And when I'm testifying, that's basically how I introduce it. I say there are two types of domestic violence, you know, then the traditional domestic violence and then coercive control and then go on to define coercive control. I like coercive control because it allows an affirmative and strength-based defense. In the case of Jeanette, she had a marvelous work history. She was a dental assistant. She had, even though she was um, designated for special ed, a, a source of enormous embarrassment for her as a child, she had a a stellar record in high school once they moved out of the house where she had been sexually abused. Her academic reading skills and math skills improved dramatically. And although she still has ADD, she told me now that she's in prison and unfortunately being kept in solitary, uh, she can read by herself very uh, advanced books and she really enjoys them simply, she told me, as literature. So in coercive control, we don't start with the idea that we're representing a sad or victimized person. We, we come to represent somebody in all her strengths, in all her full capacities as a woman. And then we show uh, what has happened to make her different. And we root that defense in principles of justice and equality. I could also add in principles of human rights. So the first thing we want to do um, is look beyond violence. Uh, the effect, and I'll, I'll say something briefly about this in a minute, but the effect of adopting the violence model, I believe, and by that I simply mean the equation of domestic violence with isolated assaults, as our criminal law tends to do, 
and the assessment of the severity of domestic violence by the level of injury or the level of violence that's inflicted. I'm going to try to show you that the level of violence, the severity of the violence, is not at all prognostic for future risk and is a very poor way of entering the case or understanding it. To the contrary, by focusing on assault as the prism through which we look at domestic violence, since 95 to 99 percent of all domestic violence assaults are low level, trivial from a medical or a police standpoint, we have in effect trivialized domestic violence. And even though millions of people are arrested each year in the United States, over a million men last year um, for domestic violence, almost none of these men, almost none of these men goes to jail. As you could see recently in the case of this uh, kicker for the New York Giants, everyone jumped on the NFL for not suspending him for a longer period of time on his uh, ex-wife for not uh, press, uh, cooperating with the investigation of the National Football League. But when you look behind it, this man had acknowledged more than two dozen assaults and hadn't received one day in jail, let alone a conviction for domestic violence. And we saw the same thing with Mr. Rice, who knocked his wife unconscious, fiance unconscious, pulled her out of the elevator, spit on her in full view of the nation on video, and didn't receive a day in jail. So it's, it seems to me hypocritical to ask our institutions to take more seriously uh, domestic violence like the football league or corporations or the media when, in fact, our legal system still continues to trivialize it. And I believe does so because the vast majority of domestic violence assaults, when considered solely in isolation, do not merit the kind of justice that would be meted out if, as in Europe, we looked at the course of conduct over time and recognized that these two dozen assaults were happening to a single victim. We'll talk about the elements and dynamics and consequences of coercive control, and hopefully, if we get time, as Susan said, we could run out, um, uh, what it means to adopt a coercive control narrative. Now, I want to step back and just say quickly um, what expert testimony on behalf of, uh, of, of defending a woman is about. I have also testified for the prosecution in prosecuting domestic violence offenders. About a third of my cases involve that. I've also testified on behalf of two men, uh, both of whom, um, I have one case now, uh, both of whom killed members of their family, their wives and other members of the family in one case. Uh, one of the cases involved the death penalty I testified in a whole range of courts, civil, federal, uh, family, uh, criminal. But I'm going to talk primarily today about the criminal cases. And there, most of my testimony, and a lot depends on the state um, or country that I'm working in, uh, is, is self involves self-defense or mitigation. Mitigation meaning that the domestic violence made whatever crime <coughs> she's convicted of uh, that much less serious. And there are two types of testimony uh, that I'm involved in, and experts tend to be involved in general, where we just talk about the nature of domestic violence, and uh, that's what I'm going to focus on today because I'm assuming that most of you are involved with that sort of testimony, and specific testimony uh, about a specific woman in a specific uh, uh, setting uh, whom you do an assessment of. Most of those experts who do that work are psychologists, some are social workers, some are psychiatrists, some are lawyers. Um, I know, <clears throat> like Nancy Erickson and other people who do this work, um, I, I tend to be a sociologist. But essentially that involves a clinical, even if they're not clinicians formally, a clinical assessment of the particular person and testimony about the specific uh, case. Now, just something on the background of defending battered women, and my, most of my cases involve homicide. Increasingly, I'm working on cases in which women are charged, because that's what my new book is about, but I'm increasingly working on cases where women are charged in the death of a child whom their partner has killed, and the partner also abusing them, failure to protect cases. And I've worked in burglary cases and um, a, a variety of criminal cases, 
settings, tax fraud cases and what have you. But I'm going to focus on uh, homicide cases because those are the cases I do most frequently. And I think what I say will be generalizable. In the past, starting in about the mid-19th century, um, when a woman killed an abusive partner, the only defense she had available to her, other than a strict self-defense, was that she was crazy. Because the assumption was that an irrational, a rational woman would never strike back against a husband who had a right to hurt her. And there's much more to be said about that, but I, I just want to... Uh, and, and there's a, a marvelous book by Ann Jones, Women Who Kill, I think it's called, uh, years and years ago, which still remains the best single historical book on uh, the battered women's uh, defense. By the time we reach uh, the uh, Francine Hughes case, the burning bed case, uh, we have our first real domestic violence expert testifying, um, uh, this, but her testimony is pretty much rejected. And the lawyer uh, against uh, the now group in Michigan's uh, advice decides to plead temporary insanity, arguing that when Francine um, poured the gasoline around the bed and burned her husband to death after putting the children in the car, uh, she had temporarily lost her mind. Uh, there couldn't be any question about her actually being insane because Francine had a long history of education, struggling with domestic violence, reaching out in various ways for help. She was clearly sane now. But the jury essentially wanted to acquit Francine and had no fundamental way to do that within the existing uh, law. Clearly it wasn't self-defense in the, any narrow understanding of that term. So temporary insanity, again, echoing the idea that no rational woman could um, commit this crime was, was the best defense. At the time, Newsweek and Time Magazine, a number of others uh, reflecting uh, uh, a number of uh, lawyer statements, pu uh, public statements, began to think this was a license to kill uh, when you start acquitting women in this situation. By the way, uh, it's called the burning bed, but I, in my book, term it the burning book case because I believe the fact that he burned her, made her burn her school books earlier that night was actually more significant than any other single factor that drove Francine uh, to kill on that evening. Because those school books represented what I term her safety zone, the place where she could, the only place where she could get out and breathe the air of a free person at school, where she had a relationship with a, a police officer, and, and breathe the air of a free person and consider her options. And when he made her burn her school books that night, he closed off that option, basically making it impossible for her to breathe freely, and, and not literally, um, but metaphorically, and I think that, that drove her. But anyway, temporary insanity was uh, the, um, the defense. The third major uh, area of defense, one that quickly followed, uh, as you will, I'm sure all know, uh, emerged from the work of Lenore Walker and essentially argued that battered women, after going through a cycle of violence a certain number of times, developed a pattern of learned helplessness that made escape seem impossible even when options were available and caused them to simply try to survive within the relationship. And a variation on that was the post-traumatic stress disorder argument that in similar circumstances, battered women exaggerated the danger they were in. And in both the battered women syndrome argument and in the PTSD argument, uh, the killing occurred as the result of a cognitive distortion, which led the battered woman, in, in the case of battered woman syndrome and PTSD, to essentially uh, mistake her circumstances, to misread her circumstances. Uh, in the case of the battered woman syndrome, not to take advantage of options and therefore to kill as the only option that they see available. And in the case of PTSD, to literally have flashbacks and to, uh, uh, to see, read a situation as more dangerous than it uh, could have been. If it's really dangerous, you don't need these arguments because you have self-defense as a straightforward, um, as a straightforward uh, option. Um, both of, I would say, certainly the battered woman syndrome uh, was uh, discredited as a general account of battering. Uh, Marianne Dutton did a marvelous 
uh, report for the NIJ years ago, I think it was about 1996, uh, where she looked at the evidence and showed that a very small percentage of, of women actually have battered women's syndrome. The Dobash is estimated it's about 14%. Uh, PTSD is common enough, but we're careful when we, want, uh, when we find PTSD to think about whether we should make it the center of our defense. Uh, um, uh, Liz Schneid, Elizabeth Schneider, in a wonderful book on, batter, on, on uh, uh, feminist lawmaking, um, argues very eloquently that once you introduce a PTSD argument, you're, even though that's not its intent, the perception of the court is that your client is crazy, and that undermines her credibility as a witness to her own experience. So my approach, which is the coercive control approach, the best approach in my view, is to approach women as rights-bearing, full, fully equal persons. And it's, uh, in terms of the courts, it's introduced not as battered women syndrome, but as testimony on battering and its consequences. And one of its functions, perhaps its major function, if you're talking generally, is simply to discount myths and paradoxes. So the myths we tend to face are that the woman didn't call the, oh, I'm sorry, and what the paradoxes, I mixed them up on the slide, is that she hasn't called the police or, or reached out in any way. A myth is that if violence isn't severe or hasn't been severe, then the abuse couldn't be severe. Or similarly, if she stayed or returned to the relationship, it couldn't be that bad. Um, very frequently, we're dealing with women who've lied about the source of their harm. In one of the cases, my cases, that uh, went to the uh, Connecticut Supreme Court, um, the woman, after uh, uh, going to the police about being tied up and burned with cigarettes and tortured by her partner, uh, then changed her testimony, arguing that she had burned herself and that she was just trying to get him into drug treatment. Um, I testified in that case getting criticized, by the way, by some uh, advocates in Connecticut for usurping the woman's prerogative, uh, which I did do, uh, that uh, battered women sometimes, I just testified in general because she wasn't available to me, that battered women sometimes uh, change their testimony because of fear and that that uh, could have been the result of the fact that this guy was still at large and was still able to intimidate her and what have you. And he was convicted. They appealed. The appeal was rejected. And my testimony was upheld. And that became the uh, first time that an expert in Connecticut on domestic violence uh, had been uh, accepted. And frequently the prosecution will call me, as it may any of you, to explain why someone might lie to the hospital or uh, to another, to the police or something about whether battering occurred. Um, the other issue, which of course the battered woman syndrome argument addresses as well, is why uh, when she had the opportunity to report, she didn't do so. For example, a number of my clients after a murder has been committed by their boyfriend fled with them and there were periods of t time, uh, in two cases at least, where they could have, they were alone and they could have called police. Uh, and so the question is, why didn't they do that? Uh, again, battered women's syndrome answers that by the learned helplessness theory. Coercive control answers that by arguing that coercive control crosses social space and time and is an ever-present reality. Uh, just to give you a sense of this, uh, when I was leaving Jeanette in prison, the last question I asked her was, and remember, she killed her husband, Keith, the last question I asked her was, how often does he visit you? And her response was, oh, he comes two or three times a week. And then we talked about what he said. Now, I knew that the imago that battered women have of their partners is bigger than life because of the level of control and an omnipotence that these men exercise over their life. And because they, these men are bigger than life, even after they're dead, they continue to have power over the women. The safety work that they have to engage in, the psychological safety work they have to, by trying to manage the image, internalize the image, have him come and reassure her that she's safe and he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to hurt her anymore, that can go on for years. So I'm, I'm just, um, uh, that's just an example of, um, and it's a, it was a cool trick too because 
it was the, one of the few things the expert consultants and the lawyers uh, hadn't figured out. It, it made a huge difference uh, with the district attorney in terms of the level of charges that he's going to, uh, uh, he's going to bring. Another paradox is that she loves him, and she insists that he, and or she insists that he's innocent. And uh, uh, in this case, um, again, Jeanette insisted, even despite the abuse I'm going to describe to you, uh, that she loved him and uh, believed that um, without him she was, she was nothing. Another paradox uh, occurs when women confess to crimes they didn't commit. Uh, and uh, I have several cases of that now. Um, and uh, again, uh, how to, uh, battered women syndrome has one explanation, insanity another, and the coercive control argument another. So this is the outline of general testimony. Um, first of all, we present the definitions of domestic violence, the typology, uh, that there are two types, domestic violence and coercive control, and we say we want to know which, which is present. Then I describe the dimensions of coercive control, which I'm about to present to you, the consequences, and these aren't mutually exclusive trauma or liberties, uh, nor are the explanations, battered woman syndrome or coercive control or PTSD, all of those can be part of your narrative. Um, uh, you talk about some of the myths and reframing contradictory acts. Sometimes you include uh, the effects on children. There's a vast literature. I have a slide on that, which I'm going to present later. But in, in, in Precy, what I'm arguing in my new book, and I believe uh, compellingly, is that coercive control, not exposure to violence, is the leading cause of child maltreatment. And I am beginning to reopen uh, loads of research that only looked at the violence and the child's violence exposure and to find that actually these guys were also coercively controlling their children using the same tactics of coercive control in their children they used with their wives. There's no literature in the American uh, um, research literature on this, but there is a, a growing literature on the use of coercive control with children um, in Europe. Uh, you may want to add an, uh, a description of dangerousness, how someone describe, defines whether uh, a case is dangerous. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Campbell um, Dangerous Assessment Scale. Um, <clears throat> Jackie's a very close friend of mine, but I don't uh, use it unless it's extremely applicable in a case because I don't think it uh, correlates well with danger. Uh, I believe that Campbell's own research, and certainly research by Connie Beck at Arizona and others, has shown that the single major predictor of fatality in domestic violence cases is not the level of prior violence, but the level of control. And Jackie's own research, as I said in the initial research, shows that the level of control, uh, the, whether there's a recent separation and the presence of a weapon are the three major factors that predict homicide in these cases, not the level of violence, and yet the dangerous assessment instrument focuses almost exclusively on physical violence and not at all and certainly not enough on control. There are alternative assessments that um, we're using in Europe and Canada that I think are more useful, but there are a number of cases where this dangerous assessment scale can be very helpful. I talk about victim tactics. I'm very careful to include in any narrative I present the many ways in which, uh, in, and I describe the many ways in which victims resist, survive, minimize, or try to escape, because it's very important, particularly in homicide cases, but not only, to show that this was the last resort, not the first resort. Now, many of these attempts uh, have to be, can be very subtle. And if, I'm, if I can, if the lawyer helps me do this, and everything in expert testimony depends on the quality of the attorney you're working with and preparing them to ask you the right questions, giving them questions, educating them about the nature of coercive control, uh, even if they think they understand domestic violence, and really helping them uh, to present a narrative from their own client that essentially uh, gets at the wealth of their own experience. And I should emphasize that the coercive control model didn't come out of research. 
It basically came out of the experience as an advocate and the experience in forensics of, of listening to women's stories. There was nothing about this in the literature to speak of. Uh, there was some in the popular literature, an early book by uh, Ann Jones and Sue Schechter, uh, some work by, um, and, and, and work by uh, Lindy Bancroft and some others. But basically, um, all of the stuff we know about coercive control comes from women's stories and letting women tell the full story about their experience and, and not from uh, uh, surveys or preconceived moral notions about what is right and, and what is wrong. Sometimes we testify about characteristics of perpetrators, and after we finish testifying, it is often the case that the uh, attorney asks us hypothetical questions based on the cases he has. I put this slide in of the three planets, uh, Marianne Hester's model uh, of the court systems, um, only because I want to remind you that expert testimony can be extremely different in the three different settings in which we practice, the criminal, the family, and the child welfare courts. And I, uh, I emphasize this because the assumptions in each of these courts, even though they may share a similarly gendered bias, the assumptions in each of these courts is completely different. The languages they use, the, the, the standards of proof, the, everything about them is completely different. So that, for example, the man who is the offender in the criminal court is the good enough father in the family court and is completely invisible in the child welfare proceeding. In fact, when we brought the Nicholson class action lawsuit, against the city of New York to try to stop them from taking children from mothers solely because the mothers were victims of domestic violence. There was, men were not, they, men were completely invisible. They, they, all cases were classified in the mother's name even if she was dead. They didn't interview men when they were placing children in foster care, which helped to explain why the rates of child abuse in foster care were as high as the rates in domestic violence situations and much higher than in uh, non, non-abusive, uh, I mean, in, in families where they didn't have domestic violence or, or child abuse. Meanwhile, the victim uh, in the uh, criminal court, who's the good witness if she persists in her um, testimony, uh, and, and, and goes after the guy in the family court is uncooperative and alienating and in the child welfare uh, proceeding is also um, uh, inviting uh, child welfare to come in and take away her child, uh, particularly if the abusive partner is not the father of the child and they have no control over him. So I'm just saying I don't have time to go into the differences, obviously, but I think it's extremely in important if you're going to go into expert testimony, that you know your setting, you know the language, you, know, you have a dictionary with you, your advocate, your lawyer can help you with that, but you need to understand from your own experience with those court systems what it is that, this, what kinds of story about your client they can hear. What is their mission? Uh, is their mission child saving? Is their mission equity? Therefore, that, uh, the assumption that men have equal rights to women, even if they've committed crimes uh, against those women and children, um, or is the assumption uh, a, a just a set of assumptions as in the criminal court? Um, <clears throat> as I said before, I think our current approach in, in the violence approach has ended up trivializing and normalizing violence. And what's happened in much, much of our system is that police return again and again to the same homes and after a while became more or less immune uh, to uh, what's going on there. Uh, if, if, and, and eventually, if not initially, turn against the victim uh, because uh, they are so frustrated by not being able to do uh, their work. And you can extrapolate from police to all other helping systems, including our own shelters where when we see the same victims again and again, uh, are, and anybody who's worked in a shelter for any length of time knows what I'm talking about, uh, we begin to label those women. They're well known, uh, they begin to take on all kinds of other uh, stigma in our system. So let me move uh, more quickly and say that in our coercive control framework, there's a distinction between fights between relative equals, 
where no one is particularly victimized or no one identifies himself as victims. Partner assault, which is uh, more or less the conventional understanding of domestic violence, which often occurs with emotional abuse, and coercive control. And every study we are seeing now is showing that 70% as a conservative estimate of the people we're seeing are victims of coercive control. I won't stop on uh, partner assault except to say that uh, women, and I don't hide this when I'm providing testimony, are as violent as men. We have over 100 studies that show that women hit men as frequently as men hit women. We all know they don't injure them as frequently, that the violence isn't as frequent. But when it simply comes to use of violence in relationships, women initiate as well as men. Um, and, uh, and for the same reasons, for control, for jealousy, uh, and the idea that women only use violence out of self-defense is stunningly naive, and I believe at this point in our movement uh, uh, harmful. Uh, partner assault is still um, the, uh, the form of abuse of choice in some communities. And the reason it is is because women are controlled by external religious cultural factors so that a partner doesn't have to tell a woman how she dresses because a mother-in-law will punish her if she doesn't dress a certain way or get her to cook or clean uh, a certain way or disallow her to work uh, because those constraints are imposed by the community as a whole and he can still use domestic violence relatively effectively. In most American homes, I believe, domestic violence is not terribly effective. So this is our definition of coercive control a strategic course of conduct, which includes these elements, which I'm now going to talk about, violence, sexual coercion, intimidation, isolation, and uh, control. And its aim is to use, uh, is to dominate and exploit a partner, not to hurt her, and to deprive her of basic rights and liberties. I would also add, as an expression of male privilege, coercive control can exist in any number of situations. Women can coercively control men, Course of control is commonplace in same-sex relationships and against transgender persons, but I am specifically talking about coercive control in the context of sexual inequality where it has the specific dynamics uh, I'm about to describe. Um, this is a definition in England. I just thought I'd put it up there so you see what a country that is progressive in this respect has done in terms of defining domestic violence a pattern of incidents of controlling, coercive, and controlling behavior. We are now arresting men in Scotland for violence against three wives stretching back 18 years, just as we would in a sexual abuse of children case. Uh, it includes psychological, physical, sexual, financial, and emotional. Now, we all know from our Duluth wheel that those are elements of domestic violence. What we have not done in this country is brought them into the legal system and recognize them as formal dimensions of criminal acts. Um, so first, let's start with the violence. And uh, the characteristics of the violence and coercive control. And it is absolutely stunning that we don't recognize this in this country because we've had the evidence of this for 40 years. The, the characteristics of the violence in abusive relationships are its frequency and its duration. And because of frequency and duration, its cumulative effect on victims. In the United States at present, someone who commits 50 domestic violence offenses, except in a very few states, is no more likely to be punished on the 50th offense than on the first, and no more likely as the uh, Brown case, the kicker case in the New York Giants indicates, who had 24 offenses, no more likely to be punished for 50 offenses than for one. And the duration averaged 5.5 to 7 years, cumulative effect. When we start adding the uh, abuse based on its frequency um, and its duration, we find that on average, the battered women we are seeing in the courts, in the shelters, in the child welfare system, and so on, have experienced usually several hundred assaults, several hundred assaults. Here's a table from uh, the Centers for Disease Control Population Survey, and I just have time to just take a look at this, and you'll see that um, the red is more than 50 times. Look how many women are reporting. Almost 50% of the abused women in the United States have been assaulted 
more than 11 times and a good 25% more than 50 times, beaten that many times, choked that many times. And these are the same women. So if you add this up, you're talking about hundreds of women. Now, in, in Jeanette's case, she told me she hadn't been assaulted till 2014 when he came back from an eight-month stint working in Alaska. And that was the first time he was violent with her. But what I learned was that, at part, and there had been these three incidents where he'd put his forearm on her neck and, and held her down. But by interviewing the children, by interviewing her mother, by interviewing her stepfather, by interviewing others in, involved, I was able to find that the domestic violence was a regular feature of the relationship, the pushing, the shoving, the breaking, putting holes in the wall, um, uh, the kicking. He had strangled her on a number of occasions. Um, and after I was finished, I could document probably uh, 30 or 40 uh, separate incidents of assault. And there were times which she described when I said, does he ever put his hands on you when you don't want him to? Oh, she said, all the time all the time. And what I want you to understand, to help a jury understand, if you do expert testimony, is that the cumulative effect of that kind of frequent, even if it's low-level violence, is devastating and hostage-like, even unto itself, just unto itself. Now, 25% of the abusive relationships, as we now know, don't have any violence, or the violence is very minimal. Of course, the controlling relationships. Um, we won't have time to talk about that, but if there are questions, maybe uh, we can address that. Now, I'm not saying there isn't severe violence. There is, and it's frequent enough. In this case, there were three acts of, you know, where he strangled her, and a number of times, or several times, where he put his forearm on her and forced her head down and, and was choking her in that way. He kept telling her, "I know how not to leave marks," uh, which which he, which he did, um, but. What I want to get across is that the typical pattern is frequent low-level violence punctuated by severe acts. But even if those severe acts don't occur, we need to impress on a court it is the course of conduct that is significant, not the individual act or assault. And sometimes I say in my testimony, well, the law defines domestic violence this way, but this is how we, and the word we is very powerful when you're a PhD, MSW, you know, with a lot of publications. Uh, you know, we refers to me, but it's nevertheless, it goes way beyond that. Uh, we in the field understand it to be X, Y, and Z. And any advocate who has worked in a shelter for more than 20 minutes has a sense of what I'm talking about. The second dimension is sexual violence. Two weeks before they got married, he had stopped drinking. He had promised not to drink anymore. He wanted to go out to a bar. She told him she couldn't. Jeanette told him not to go out to the bar. He jumped on her, put her on the pool table, and raped her. From that time on, she told me, and many of my clients have said the same thing, I never said no to him again. Over the next 20 years, he sexually assaulted her with bottles, with broomsticks, with virtually anything that was available. He tied her down with handcuffs. It got so that she was sleeping toward the end with a gun under her pillow. This is a woman who told me there was no violence until 2014. Of course, what happened was, just for the clinicians in the audience, what happened was that once he had raped her on that pool table, she regressed to the time when she was sexually abused by her uncle, a time of helplessness, almost childlike dependence. And so she, she never resisted his sexual demands again. And uh, they did, there were a lot of other things that went on, other forms of sexual coercion. Um, and I'll talk about those momentarily. But this just shows you what we know about rape. Um, that the vast majority of rapes in our society are committed by acquaintances, somewhere around 92% acquaintances and family members. Now, this is going to be a little controversial, what I'm going to say. I'm sure the other things I've said are not controversial. But this is a little controversial because the fact of the matter is that the vast, 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 vast majority of sexual assaults in our society have nothing to do with the medical legal model of rape as rape stranger rape. That model is completely inapplicable, except in the most uh, trivial physical sense, to the kinds of sexual assaults that we see in, in abusive relationships. First of all, they are repeated. 
And, and by the way, what happens when we go with a medical legal model and somebody complains about a husband's rape is that is they are almost never prosecuted. The attrition rate in, uh, in partner rape cases from reports to police to prosecution is 97%. That is 3%, 3 out of every 100 women who complain, uh, it, it results in a conviction. Many of these men are arrested, but they're not convicted. And why? First of all, because the rapes have been repeated. And if they're repeated, that discredits the victim. Secondly, it's because the woman withdraws her complaints. Why? Because he's still at large. Thirdly, uh, it's because she has secondary problems, secondary to the abuse, that also discredit her testimony. But the important point is that from the standpoint of our clients, the battered women, the rape is not just rape. It's part of a continuum of sexual coercion and dominating behavior and has to be set in that context. Also, the rapist is a normal Joe. He's not the pathological loner who has driven by sex power drives, you know, like Donald Trump. He's, he's your typical American Joe, goes to work every day, looks just like John Q. And if the police look at that guy through the prism of the medical legal stereotype of the rape offender, they're not going to believe, they're not going to find credible what she says. These sexual assaults are rooted in normative masculinity, not rooted in some kind of aberrant sense of, of, of power and control that's um, uh, typical of a, some subset of uh, uh, men. And women don't experience the rape, at least in my caseload as separate from the insults that are occurring every day in their relationship. So they're particularly unresponsive to rape protocols, which want their boyfriend or somebody significant other to be brought in to help them counsel or, or, or what have you. Um, and um, again, while they report and, and often the guy's arrested, he's almost never charged. So again, getting the interpersonal sexual assault across, but also locating that on a spectrum of sexual coercion, which extends from, yes, literal rape, but again, like in Jeanette's case, once she's raped on the pool table, he doesn't ever have to rape her again. So that is at the other end of the spectrum, what I call rape as routine, where he's not literally raping her, but where her fear of coercion or else um, uh, understanding that she has let's, makes her yield in, in each case. And, of course, in the middle, we have forms of reproductive coercion, sexual degradation, and sex against the will. I don't have time to go into the rates of anal rape and so forth and so on, but nothing in coercive control minimizes the violence involved. What it does is it shows that the violence and the control occur together as part of a pattern. Often the control setting the stage for the violence, not the reverse. It's often when he has her controlled when she can no longer muster the capacity to effectively resist and survive, that she is then most vulnerable to the violence. This is why the control level predicts uh, post-divorce and all kinds of other uh, rates of violence, whereas the level of violence is not predictive. Reproductive coercion, forced pregnancies, forced abortions, um, sexual degradation. Uh, this is one of my clients, Dila Barisha. Um, I, I don't have time to uh, go into that, but you can see that uh, what Jeanette told me is quite common, that once she, he, she was raped, she didn't say uh, no again. The second element is intimidation, and I have to move sort of quickly to get through what I want to say. Um, but basically, intimidation runs the gamut uh, and, and, and shouldn't, shouldn't surprise us. Um, uh, most of the obvious threats of violence, destruction of property. I told you that Keith did all of these things, uh, harassment through the network. Uh, he stalked her, cyber stalked her. Uh, um, probably the most important, too, are the use of children and stalking. But I also want to emphasize, and I think it's important for juries to understand this, that because abuse, coercive control is so individualized, because it's based on the privileged knowledge of that particular victim that this guy has by virtue of his intimacy with her, he can use elements of what makes her proud of herself, things that are most meaningful to her. He can build those into his strategies of intimidation and control. And so each case is individualized, and that makes some of these threats uh, invisible, right? And, and, and in fact, many of the threats look like love. 
And it's very important that only she can understand. For example, one of my clients is a softball pitcher, and when her boyfriend wants to really terrify her and she's done really well, he comes out on the field and he offers her her sweatshirt and says, darling, you're cold, here's your sweatshirt. And only she understands the message that she'll have to cover up tonight. Uh, and the other people think, oh, what a loving, what a lovely, loving guy he is. Um, we have to stop looking at uh, somebody withdrawing their complaint as a failure of nerve and start charging that and reframing that for courts as witness intimidation so that uh, we reframe a victim's most negative behaviors as part of our uh, narrative uh, presentation. Um, I, won't, I don't have time to go into the evidence on stalking. Uh, those of you who are not familiar with her work should definitely Google T.K. Logan and read her magnificent work on stalking. But stalking is the single most common and most devastating form of intimidation that is associated with coercive control. More damaging psychologically than violence because you never know when he's going to appear. Uh, it's, it's absolutely terrifying. This is one of our posters that we're using in England uh, and give you some sense of, of what that's about. But the most common form of stalking we need to acquaint people with is internal stalking. In, in the Jeanette's case, Keith would follow her from room to room when she was cleaning, correcting her. He would stalk her literally almost everywhere she went, whether into the kitchen, she had to leave the bathroom door open and he would come in periodically, even though there were children in the house. Uh, internal stalking occurs in about 30% of these relationships and most stalking begins before partners separate while the partners are still together through various forms of surveillance, which I think most of you are aware of, but certainly should uh, educate a court about the various forms of micro, uh, I, I'm sorry, of digital surveillance, uh, proxy surveillance, use of children in surveillance, all kinds of ways that partners have of extending abuse across social space. So even though they may be physically separated, if she doesn't answer his text by the uh, within 10 minutes, there are consequences. If she doesn't return a cell phone, within, a cell phone call within 15 minutes, there are consequences. Um, and this is why uh, the separation uh, from an abuser does nothing to reduce the level of coercive control in a relationship. And they actually enhance her fear, causing her to return to the devil she knows rather than to live with the chronic anxiety that he might show up at any time. This is a quote from a woman who said that going to the bathroom was like going to France. Uh, I finished a murder case recently where the, the guy timed them in the bathroom um, uh, and, so, and the children were so terrified that they would uh, go to the bathroom in the snow outside of their house in the middle of the winter rather than risk their father's uh, ire. But coming in, you know, uh, all kinds of invasions of the most personal levels. Here's CDC data that shows violence, the rape, and the stalking uh, occurring together in a huge proportion of relationships. And again, our law only focuses on the domestic violence episode. Rarely is the rape and sexual assault charged, and if it is, it's charged at the reduced level of the domestic violence. And almost never are these three events uh, charged together. But what's important for the, the, the lawyers that are on listening, and I think others who are interested in this, is that we don't get convictions in stalking, we don't get convictions in partner rape, because with a very few exceptions, Texas is one, we can't introduce the evidence of the context, the domestic violence context, as a way to make credible a woman's claim that she stalked room to room. What happened in Jeanette's home was that her 12-year-old daughter, Brianna, took over all of the chores from her mother uh, it, the cleaning, the cooking, the yard work, the shopping and everything because she was hoping that she could please her father in a way that would keep him from abusing her but also uh, protecting um, uh, her mother. Uh, the degradation we explain, the targeting areas of gender identity, her weight, whatever means to her, uh, that is the area he targets. A woman told me recently that uh, a week after her divorce, uh, she came home and her whole backyard was filled with flowers. It turned out that gardening was her favorite uh, thing. But now, now that may seem like nothing to folks, but to the extent that it invaded her safety zone, 
that his search and destroy mission was to close off any area of pride that she had and that he could do it from a distance, it was absolutely devastating and terrifying. Uh, the, uh, the third element of coercive control, or the fourth, uh, the sexual abuse, the violence, the intimidation, uh, is, is isolation. And in every single case I have been involved, uh, women are isolated from all of the sources of friends, uh, all of the sources from which they derive support, and even from which they get their sense of reality and identity. In extreme cases, the level of isolation can predict a kind of traumatic bonding or Stockholm Syndrome, where the woman comes to believe the only person who can protect her is the man who is hurting her. It's not that she has battered woman syndrome, but that the structural constraints on her life uh, make her dependence on his sense of reality, the only reference point she has for her own sanity. Uh, by the time uh, Jeanette killed her husband, there was not a moment of the day or the week when she wasn't with him. He had forced her to leave her job. She was working at the gun shop with him during the day. He stalked her at the house. When she went out shopping, he made sure either one of the children was with her or he was with her. Um, there was no time at all. She told me, we were always together. Um, and, and, you know, while on the outside I might see that as a loving couple, the reality was that she was completely isolated. And women isolate themselves, and it's important for juries to understand that. And, and what he had done in the case, I, I won't have time to go into it, but what he had done in, in this case was he had driven two of the girls, one by the older one, the stepdaughter, by sexual abuse, and the other daughter by physical abuse. He had driven two of the girls from the home, and that was significant because they were the ones who gave – uh, Jeanette, uh, all of her support in the house. And now he was jealous of Aiden. And the fact that the argument that resulted in his death began with Aiden and the garage and his implicit threat that he was now going to beat Aiden, which he did regularly, Aiden was seven, that he was now going to beat Aiden, um, was an absolute trigger point uh, in that relationship for a very high level of fear. But the essence of coercive control, and and, you know, unfortunately, we could go for another hour on this, is the control itself. Coercive control is a structural explanation of abuse that doesn't depend on the psychological profile or effects on the victim. And by structural, I mean that the woman is put in an absolute position of dependence that would be the same if any of us had our money taken away, were treated like a servant, were deprived of the money and other resources that we had, had our medications taken away from us, and <clears throat> probably most dramatically and most invisibly, although it's recognized again now by the European Council and in England, have the micromanagement of our everyday life, what the Europeans call the arbitrary violations of liberty. Jeanette was being told, as are dozens of my clients, how to dress, how to clean, how to cook, whom to talk to, for how long, how to make love, with whom to make love. There was no area of her life, her everyday life, which was not being invaded and in intrusive. And it is this deprivation of resources, which are actually resources and rights that are fundamental to becoming a citizen, that define the essence of coercive control and, and why when we mount a defense based on coercive control, it's proactive because we're saying women have the right to be full persons. Now let's take a full person. Let's take a man and let's assume we've taken his money or forced him to dress in a certain way or told him he had to sleep on the floor or stay awake all night because I wasn't finished talking to him or, or get tied naked. These were all examples from my clients tied naked in the backyard because the bath water was in a certain temperature. And that person then struck out and killed. Isn't that a proactive defense of liberty? And the only reason we don't grieve women suffering in the same way as that we grieve men suffering or the suffering of persons that are treated as fully equal is because women are not deemed fully equal. And therefore they have to provide psychological proofs that when their basic liberties have been infringed in the ways this table suggests, that it's important. All right. I don't have time to go into the rest. I'll just summarize them quickly. First of all, when I'm talking about batterers, I talk specifically not, about, not only about the profile, but about the privilege. And why men do this um, has to do with 
uh, the actual privileges that they accrue, minimal though they may seem to the outside world, in their own mind, both psychological and material, for staying. And everyone who works in the field knows that the problem we have is not getting women out of the situation, it's getting the men out of the community and denying them access. And for a jury, it's very important to turn their preconception of why does she stay into why does he keep coming back. Um, I'm going to skip to the sort of punchlines and say that in the assessment that I do, I think about rights, not just harms. So when I talk about violence, I reference the right people have to security, intimidation, the right people have to dignity and to live without fear, and isolation, the right to association and control the right to independence and autonomy. And the significance of presenting these rights, you see, is that we're saying this is an aff affirmation of who she is as a citizen, not just the self-defense because her physical body is threatened, but a defense of the very basic liberties that we're born with and constitutionally entitled to. Now, of course, a jury may say, well, women aren't really entitled to those full liberties and habits because they're not really fully equal or fully equal persons. But it's very difficult once you've presented a rights narrative for them to say that. And so we move from an injury model to an entrapment model and arguing that what makes a battered woman is not the violence, but the inability for her to uh, effectively escape. And I want to emphasize, as we do for juries, and I'll say this in closing, that coercive control, woman abuse, is not about what men do to women, at least not in the way that I present it. The way I present it is that this woman is trying to get on with her life projects. This woman starred as a dental assistant. This was very meaningful for her, Jeanette. She had gone through her entire life priding herself on her parenting. There were so many things she did well. Every battered woman I've ever worked with is a feminist, not with a capital F, but with a small f in the sense that they're trying to make their life projects and they're trying to build a life that they know they're capable of doing. And so what he prevents her from doing is, is, is though he prevents her from fulfilling those projects. And it's the denial of the community, the family, and her of the right to develop those projects that makes the wrong of battering. Um, and, and what we show when we're dealing with the tactics women use is that they're exercising control, but in the context of no control. What I mean is they're doing the best they can. When she shot her husband that night, Jeanette was trying to manage as best she could, not just to keep herself safe, but to keep herself sane. And when she said she loved him, what she meant was that she had done all she could in her life, just like Jesus, you might say. Now, I'm a Jew, so I take this with a grain of salt. But just like Jesus, we might say, had done all she could to live with and try to bear his suffering and his misery. But at this point, she, it, had, it had just gotten too much for her to do. And she chose her own personhood in a sort of the same way uh, a hostage might shoot a sleeping guard. She chose her personhood uh, in, in the final analysis, even though she loved this man. So let me stop there. And um, certainly if there are questions, I'm happy to answer them. Sorry, Sue, I went a little over. No, that's okay, Evan. Um, first of all, thank you so much, and I do. I hope you could hear me. Oh, absolutely. I mean, all right. And it was really great. I mean, and I do know you have a lot more to say, so maybe we should think about a part two. Um, but I also just want to say out loud that when our speaker commented on a certain person who is running for president, that that particular moment was not funded by the federal government. Okay, oh. <laughs> and um, we're going to note that he did so without our prior knowledge. But you notice that I didn't, I didn't comment on him negatively. I was contrasting him positively to normative masculinity. Sorry, well, let's, let's <laughs> I won't, I won't aggravate, add insult to injury. I apologize to OVW. Um, so. Uh, we have a few questions, so I am going to turn this over to my coworker, Cindine Fazell, 
Uh, she's our legal coordinator here, and she is the lead staff person on our expert witness project. So, Sandine, I see there's a few questions there. Uh, yeah. So if you want to pose those to Evan, that would be terrific. Thank you. Sure, sure. Thank you. And thanks, Evan. Um, we, we got a question about whether or not you have a um, quote, unquote, coercive control wheel that you use during your testimony. And I want to broaden that a little bit to ask if you ever use any kind of visual, visual aids. And if I, so, I, I don't. I, I'm, you know, I'm so stunning. I try to focus the jury's attention on me. No, I, I don't, and it's because I'm lazy. And I know that people have used wheels, and there are all coercive control wheels back. In fact, around. In fact, you could argue that the power and control wheel is a coercive control wheel. Um, and you know, visual aids can be very, very effective. I just don't use them personally. Thank you. Um, and we got another question asking, what, in your experience, have you found to be effective and helpful in preparing defense attorneys uh, to present coercive control? Well, it's, it, 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 the preparation of defense attorneys is twofold. First of all, it's how to um, prepare their um, client, the defendant, or in family cases, their client, um, to testify, which issues to bring out and which issues not to bring out. Um, the second thing is to educate them about how to question me and how to use me as an expert. And I do two things. I mean, first of all, I send them literature, and, you know, you hope they'll read one thing. And, and you know, sometimes I send them a case report, uh, you know, that some of the ones that Sandeen has, you have in your library there, and, and that I've done. And, and uh, sometimes, I, usually, I send them a series of questions, specific questions. And then they respond to that, and then we go over that. Now, the challenges with hypotheticals, as some of you may know, is that some courts will only allow hypotheticals if they specifically refer to facts that are already in evidence. Uh, some will ref allow you to use hypotheticals more broadly. A hypothetical would be something like, um, well, if somebody went to the hospital and they asked her how they got the bruise, and she said um, that she got it falling, into, falling off a, a um, uh, a platform, uh, is that consistent with uh, coercive control? You know, that, that would be the kind of question that we would be asked. So, so I, in those three ways of sending uh, case reports, sending um, uh, questions, um, certainly talking as much as I can to the attorney and helping them work out the structure of the narrative uh, is it, it, very important. Now, the other thing I have done, and I, you know, I don't know if this is kosher for every expert, is I've worked with witnesses in preparation for evaluations um, because I think there are a lot of people, no matter how much you tell them, who believe that evaluators are psychologists and they should pour their heart out. And unfortunately, you know, I, I, I don't know if OVW is, would be unhappy if, what I, if I said bad things about family attorneys. But family attorneys are not, um, and please read, read my lips here, Family attorneys are not necessarily the most conscientious um, uh, people on the earth. And, and, and so it's very often the case that they don't properly prepare uh, a client, and in criminal cases it's the same, to go to a psychiatric evaluation. So sometimes I will work with someone, not, not to fool the evaluator, but just to clarify uh, what are the kinds of things the evaluator uh, can uh, is, is supposed to do and not supposed to do, and therefore what are the kinds of things that you should be sharing with an evaluator, and which kinds of things are inappropriate for you to share with an evaluator. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we, we got another question that I think um, is about general testimony, but general testimony where you have um, some information about the facts of the case versus general testimony where you just kind of go in blind and talk about DV. Um, what, are your, what are your thoughts on, um, on which approach could be better or, uh, you know, or how you would prefer to go about it? Or well, I had a slide on that which I took out. I think in general, it, look, I prefer case-specific testimony because I learn more from it. You know, it's a lot more work. It costs more money. You know, it's, it's, it's a challenge. But I think, you know, but here, here's the thing. Uh, 
many attorneys, and you know, this is more true in family cases, but not only, many attorneys simply aren't good at um, getting their clients to tell their stories. I think if a good attorney can get their client to tell a story, uh, you don't need an expert in that case. And general testimony is sufficient. The other time general testimony is preferable is when the facts of the case are very complicated. So on the one hand, if you have a very good defendant narrative, you don't need an expert to do an assessment. You just need somebody to talk about uh, the myths and the paradoxes to help the jury understand some of the questions that might arise in their minds. Um, on the other side of the issue is if you have a very complex case and where your interview might lead you to find out things or to report things that might be at odds with some of the complex detail that the victim or somebody else has, the defendant in this case victim, has presented to the court. So in a recent case, I had spent a lot of time interviewing a woman charged with murder, but the lawyer decided at the last moment, because she was so good and because the case was so complex, to just have me provide general testimony. And my colleague whom I brought into the case, he wouldn't use her report at all because one of the lines that she had told the, uh, this other psychologist was, I just couldn't stand it anymore. I couldn't take it anymore. And the psychologist, being conscientious, had recorded that sentence. And even though her report was generally very, very excellent, the fact is that that sentence could have compromised, he felt, that sentence could have compromised the argument of self-defense. So he didn't use that report. He didn't use me only for general testimony. So I think I think those those are the you know I think general testimony uh, in family cases you, I'm rarely allowed to give anything but general testimony because um, I, I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist and they tend to not want that and also because those are not cases usually in which an expert gives specific. Uh, testimony. In those cases, they usually have court evaluators or family psychologists or somebody else. So I, I don't know if that answers the question um, uh, uh, adequately. Thanks, Evan. Sue, do we have time for one more or do we need to? I feel like Amy's question is a big one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I've, and, you know, and of course, I provide general testimony in cases where the victim won't cooperate. Right. Um, I mean, uh, but, but there are also cases, and I want to emphasize this. I use the example, but I want to underline it. There are also cases where an expert assessment could compromise the defense. I have a child death case where I'm going to interview the woman in Rikers Island in a couple of weeks. But I'm very worried after reading the Child uh, Protective Services report that if I were to do a specific assessment, it would hurt the case. It wouldn't help it. So I probably will tell the attorney that my advice would be not to use me as a, as a fact witness, you know, as a specific witness, but just use me to describe the general syndrome. So, Amy, I think we're going to have to ask Evan to come back and do another webinar. No, that's about all right. The new, the new <laughs> we have, we the have new my event. clock says we have another minute and a half. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But um, I, she, it really is talking about the coercive control law in the UK. And she asked if there's been any unintended negative consequences either for victims or for the criminal justice system. Well, not yet. I, I think the problem in the UK has been that they don't, ha they haven't resourced it. The training materials, if you can access them online, are magnificent. And you know, look, I would be, you know, there is one uh, women's advocacy group that has been opposing us. Uh, there are two shelter groups in the UK, Women's Aid and Refuge. Women's Aid is far the biggest one, and they support it. But Refuge has been worried that it's going to shift the attention away from the violence. And, and I don't think that's going to happen. It hasn't happened. But it certainly is, you know, is, is, is a worry. People were worried men would use it. So far, that hasn't been the case. It, it certainly could be. The real problem we're facing is with prosecutors and judges. Judges in England, I, I'm, I don't want to talk about the United States, but it's very similar, believe nobody can train them. They know what domestic violence is when they see it. And they ha don't have a tradition, as we do here, of advocacy groups training judges. Prosecutors there are also very reluctant to get involved in these cases. Um, but police are the most supportive of these because what it means to them, and I just want you to get this, they're overwhelmed. Their caseloads are overwhelming, and domestic violence is far and away their most common. They spend more money on domestic violence than on defense in England. 
and and they are the cops are overwhelmed, and and more than fifty percent, more like sixty to seventy percent of the caseloads are repeat cases. So if they can only get a handful of these guys off the street, they would be reducing their caseloads uh, geometrically rather than just arithmetically. In other words, they, they would be, you know, dramatic reductions in their caseloads. And I believe over 10 years, even though what's happened is that since the new law has gone in, reporting has increased one third. So, so you know, this is, this is worrisome to them. But I believe that within 10 years it will go down again. But I, but I want to underline this. The major change this new law has made and will make is the difference in the way women tell their stories. And the media, the, the show, The Archers, illustrates this. And the way in which stories are being reported now of abuse. And thousands of women are coming forward and identifying themselves and telling the stories about being abused um, because of this course and control understanding that never would have come forward uh, before. I had the head of one, uh, Scottish Women's Aid came to me and said, before she uh, read the book and before she understood coercive control, she could not talk about herself as an abused woman and no one in the movement would take it seriously because she hadn't been harmed physically. So, Evan, I am going to okay. stop you there because I, I do think that's another conversation that I, I think there is interest in, um, you know, talking about more about the legal. Well, anybody who's interested in the English law, they write me. I'll send them the three articles I did for a domestic violence report on the European um, response. If, if you can't see his email, it's starkevan342 at gmail.com. So starkevan342. So I am only email. 74. You're right. <laughs> there you go. So thank you, everybody. For joining us today, and Evan, really, that was terrific, and we Good. really appreciate your time and your smarts and your wisdom. Great. And yeah, so people are saying thank you, and we are. God bless everybody. Now. Get and out there you. and do it. And, and do it. <laughs> so that, so with Evan, Evan's words of um, you know encouraging us to get out there and do it, go forth, people, and thank you, Evan. I'll give you a call in a second. Okay. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.